Spoon and Crockett Country, presented by Loophole. As humans, we marvel at and are fascinated by nature. Of all the sights and sounds of nature, nothing is more captivating to us than animals. Unlike the prairie, trees or mountains, animals move. They interact, they are curious, and they are unpredictable. Some animals are more interesting to observe than others, and different animals hold our fascination in different ways. This attraction to wildlife begins at an early age and evolves differently over time with different people. For some, this interest remains constant throughout life. For sportsmen, we are not satisfied just seeing and learning about wildlife in books, on screen, on farms, or in captivity. Somewhere along the way, this fascination for nature evolved into the need to be personally close to wildlife. And this led to taking up the pursuit. To get close and be successful on the hunt, sportsmen like no other become students of game behavior. Knowing what the game is and will be doing is therefore the keys to success. Nowhere is this more evident and exciting than being in the woods during the most active time in the annual life cycle of game animals, the breeding season. One such ritual played out each fall and participated in by thousands of bow and arrow carrying hunters is the elk rutting season. The breeding seasons of other deer species get their fair share of attention, but there is something special about elk. With European stags, it's called a roar. For elk in North America, the piercing scream of male reproductive health is called a bugle. The state of Colorado boasts the largest concentration of elk in North America, with a population estimated at 230,000 animals. Andy York is the vice president of sales and marketing for American optics giant Leupold and Stevens. He and the Boone and Crockett Club's marketing director, Keith Balford, Balford's boyhood hunting companion from Ohio, Tom Leskoski, and Leupold's optics rep in Colorado, Steve Seitz, all converged in northwestern Colorado for the opportunity to hunt the state's rutting bulls. The target date of this rendezvous was September 18th, a date chosen very carefully. Balford and Laskoski had hunted Colorado's High Lonesome Ranch once before, but for mule deer. It was then that the pair learned they had inadvertently stumbled into an elk bonanza. The exact timing of the breeding cycle for all ungulates can change from year to year, by days or even a week or more. What hunters refer to as hunting the rut is actually hunting different phases of the breeding period, and that can span as much as three months' time. Successfully hunting each phase depends on being able to identify what phase the elk are in at any given time and adapting your strategy accordingly. Keep in mind these stages can be different for individual groups on the same range. For example, one group of elk may be involved in male hierarchy selection, while on a distant ridge another group of elk are already forming a harem. York's group anticipated that by September 18th, High Lonesome's elk would be in the herd gathering phase based on what his partners observed the previous year. What they found was that this second phase of the rut had not yet taken place, but could in the days ahead. The breeding cycle of elk actually starts in mid-August when bulls shed their velvet. This shedding is aided by bulls racking brush with their antler sets. With developed antlers fully hardened and clear of the dried velvet, Bulls will then turn to saplings and small trees to strengthen fighting muscles and advertise their presence. The first signs that the rut is near is the interaction between the bulls to establish herd hierarchy and breeding priority. What to look for, or better yet, what to listen for, are the bulls just screaming back and forth at one another. This is followed by some bulls beginning to gather cows into harems, which is the first real interaction between cows and bulls. Cow gathering is typically done by mature bulls, but not always the oldest and biggest bulls. Most experienced bull hunters favor the herd gathering phase of rut. This is when the bulls, especially the mature bulls, are most responsive to cow calls and bugles. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with the Wild Sheep Foundation, putting and keeping sheep on the mountain. 
Remington, arms and ammunition. Welcome to Remington country. And the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide. The first days on the ground in Colorado were spent shadowing elk from a distance, wisely observing behavior to determine a strategy based on where the elk were in their breeding cycle. I think we definitely made the right call this morning not driving this road because we, we would have just blown these elk right out of here. We've got, what, eight bulls. This prevailing wind is going to be west to east all week long, and it's, it, it's going to be a challenge further down below because of the angle of the ridge we're going to have a, a better opportunity in the evening to go intercept these bulls coming back up the ridge because the wind is going to be crosswise it seems like just based on what we saw this morning that the elk are just kind of in this cow gathering mode you know all these bulls mill around seem to be still taller than each other that, that's going to change hopefully in our favor here over the next few days. It was clear some bulls were beginning to pay attention to cows, while others were still just palling around together, but testing each other's mettle. Plans for tree stand placement were laid, as well as checking springs and wallows for activity. A bull elk bugle is an advertisement with purpose. Bulls bugle to proclaim their strength and breeding fitness. They also bugle to advertise their location to other bulls, but most importantly to cows. Cow elk are attracted to the protection provided by mature bulls and a harem collects. Under the watchful eye of the herd bull, the cows can relax and feed and put on important fat reserves that'll help them make it through the winter and have a successful and productive calving period in the spring. As the hunt unfolded, it became evident that evenings produced the best chances for close encounters within bull range. During morning sessions, if you cannot figure out how to get in front of the elk before they reach their daytime bedding area, you're just in for a long walk, pushing alert elk ahead of you. Keith, I got a good bull. Where are you looking? Go up the drainage. There's a lone pine tree. The cow just went behind the pine tree. The bull's out right now. Yep, yep, I got him, I got him. That's a good bull. He's got good fronts. He's got good mass. You think we could get on him? I don't think it's prudent to go in there and bust them up. I think what we can do is we can get down this ridge this evening and set up on the tank down there. I guarantee you they're, they're hitting that tank. You know, I think they're, they're starting to bed. It's just been that these bulls haven't moved at all. So far, all our close encounters are coming in the evening. This, this morning thing is we always seem to be a step behind them. I think if we don't press it this morning and bust them out of here, we'll have a good chance of slipping in on them tonight. Sounds good. We'll relieve them and attack them later. Yeah. While the most dominant and largest bulls in an area are typically late to join the rutting activity, younger bulls are not. Late on the third day, Belfort and Laskowski's plan for that evening paid off, capitalizing on the unsuppressed urges of a group of younger bulls by calling one within bow range. There he is, right there, Keith. Oh, nice, big five. Nice five. Nice. Thank you. We hunted about two hours on the other ridge from about 3.30, 4 o'clock, and heard nothing. And we made a little bit of move, heard the one bugle, and we tried the cow decoy and the calls, but he went the other way. Well, we heard those bulls down in here and popped up over the ridge, threw up the cow decoy. You bailed down about 60 yards and I stayed up to cow call. We call, cow called a lot. Yeah, we called a combination of that cow decoy and calling is, you know, you called in some bulls last night. This guy saw that decoy on the skyline. He came in on a string. We actually had another bull coming. I think we can call any satellite bull in here. Oh, yeah. Because yes. the big boys have the cows. The big boys have And there's cows. a lot of big satellites that I'd shoot. Yep, there's a lot of nice six points running around here, but this is a dandy archery bull, man. Yeah, and I thank you again, man. I'm okay. happy. Don't have any of these in Ohio, do they? Nope. Nope. York and Sites have been focusing their efforts over what water was available in the area. Sitting at springs and wallows proved productive with close encounters 
but either decisions were made to pass smaller bulls, or the bulls they hoped would commit and present a shot seem more interested in standing guard over cows and not hydrating themselves. Surface water is vital to all elk, but especially during rut. Water not only hydrates, but it provides hydration at a time of intense physical activity. Surface water is also a gathering place where elk meet. Water also cools the overheated bodies of bulls that have been busy on their feet, keeping cow groups together and challengers away. Bulls use wallows or mud holes to cool themselves, to heal their wounds, to amplify their rutting odors, and also to apply coats of mud, which make them look darker and more intimidating to rivals. Optical Insights presented by Lupo, America's Optics Authority. In a previous segment, we discussed how rangefinders work and some of the factors that affect ranging performance in the field. But have you ever had difficulty just seeing through the rangefinder in low light? Hi, I'm Tim Lesser, and using a rangefinder that has an LED display eliminates this problem. Many rangefinders use an LCD display in an effort to keep prices low. These are easily identified by the use of black numbers in the display. This is a great system for affordability but the light must pass directly through the display to reach your eye. The result is lower light transmission and is why some hunters have noticed they can see the animal in their binocular but cannot find it in their rangefinder. Another display option offered by Leupold uses an LED to project red numbers into the light path. Though more expensive, an LED display triples the light transmission value equal to even the best binoculars. Optical Insights has been brought to you by Leupold, America's Optics Authority. Boone and Crockett Country is in partnership with Buck Knives, knives that fit your life, and the Pope and Young Club for the good of bow hunting. Elk camp at midday can be a fidgety time of keeping in shooting shape, staring at maps, thinking about what could have been, and planning to exhaustion where to hunt that evening. One would think it would also be a good time to catch up on some sleep, but no one could sleep. With one bull down and the rut progressing, everyone knew the bomb could go off at any time. Over the course of rut, there can be only a handful of days when things really get cooking. This is typically when herds are still loosely being formed, several bulls are in close proximity of what cows have been gathered, and the first cow of the season comes into heat. It can be a sight to behold. When everything comes together, these are the days that bow hunters dream of. For the evening of the sixth day, Seitz decided to take up his position on a water hole where he had faith it would only be a matter of time before a shot presented itself. Balfour and York decided it was time to press and drop into the bucket, an amphitheater they knew held bulls, but they had been saving for the right wind conditions. It didn't take long before bugles from bulls leaving daytime timber confirmed it was time to get aggressive. In truth, not every setup pays off with a shot. The ratio could be one in five, it could be one in 10, or never pan out at all. But when it does, it's an emotional high and a playback that will stay with you for the rest of your life. That was an awesome hunt. I didn't see your bull. I got it. I didn't see the hit, but it sounded like solid. Well, he came in to like 20 yards, but then when I went to draw, it was, he came up that hill so quick when you cow called. I went to draw and I think that spooked him. He went back downhill about 15 yards and stopped. 
I saw you at full draw. I was at full draw. <laughs> it did sound solid. I, I thought it was money. And then just, you, just based on sound. So I marked the spot. We'll have to come back and sun up and yeah, see if we can pick up a blood trail. Fair Chase Hunting is presented by the Boone and Crockett Club. With the largest herd of American elk in North America, it is no surprise that the state of Colorado is a haven for elk hunters, especially bow hunters. Annually, thousands of bow hunters step into elk country across the state to partake in a month-long archery season that coincides with the elk rut in late August through late September. Many of these archers are non-resident hunters, traveling under the benefit of an easy-to-obtain, over-the-counter, statewide, either-sex elk tag. As in any elk destination, Colorado is unequaled for opportunity. The Centennial State also ranks high as a trophy destination for archery bulls. Records kept by the Pope and Young Club list Colorado as the third most prolific state or province for record class bulls historically and second over just the past 10 years. The key is quality habitat and science-based herd management. Colorado is blessed with an abundance of diverse habitat well suited for grazing and foraging elk populations. The lands west of Interstate 25, which splits the state in half from north to south, represent the western edge of the Great Plains, climbing up to encompass most of the southern Rocky Mountains. Within this region are 30 of the highest major summits of the Rocky Mountains, sending down ample water through alpine and subalpine fir, aspen groves, oak brush to sage plateaus and flats. In other words, elk country. To qualify as a Pope and Young Bull, a typical elk must score over 260 and 335 as a non-typical. A typical elk's final score is the sum total of inches to the nearest eighth of an inch, taking into account the length of each main beam, the length of each point or tine, four mass measurements from the left and right antlers, and the inside spread. The length of abnormal points and any differences in symmetry between the left and right antlers are deducted from the total to calculate the final score. For a bull that has grown enough abnormal points to score better as a non-typical, the total length of abnormal points are added, not subtracted, from the bull's typical score. In general, a long-timed mature 5x5 or fully developed 6x6 bull will score over 260 Pope and Young. With the sheer abundance of elk, the availability of tags, vast amounts of national forest and BLM land for self-guided hunting, and seasons coinciding with the elk rut, it is no surprise why so many bow hunters flock to Colorado each season. Records book bull or not, just being in elk country during the fall as the aspens go from green to yellow and orange before your eyes is something equaled only by the scream of a rutting bull coming from that same stand of trees. Fair Chase Hunting was presented by the Boone and Crockett Club. Boone and Crockett Country has been brought to you by Leupold. America's Optics Authority, and the Boone and Crockett Club, fair chase and conservation since 1887. Hunters are the one segment of society that carry forward a youthful fascination with nature into a higher level of appreciation and respect. The process that turns observer into hunter also comes with a buy-in unique to hunters, the need to become true students of the game they pursue and take in all knowledge about the animal's biology, habits, behavior, and movements. The more we know about, respect, and appreciate the game we hunt, a sense of duty and obligation develops. And along with this, ethical decisions that guide our behavior. As hard as it can be for some to understand, True sportsmen do not like to see any animal, wild or domestic, suffer. We would like to think that bow hunting is an exacting science. It is not. Like all human activities, efficiencies come with experience, and at some point, everyone is a beginner. Even with the experience of taking game by bow and arrow, every shot is different. Research recently conducted by the Pope and Young Club confirms what many already know that modern-day bow hunting is an effective hunting method practiced by responsible sportsmen. Bow hunters surveyed after the 2009 season reported that of over 3,100 arrows released at game, 92% of animals hit were recovered, 86% of which were recovered the same day. Only 1.5% of animals believed to be fatally hit went unrecovered. 
bow hunters, maybe more so than any other group, subscribe to the fact that choosing a bow over a modern firearm comes with an unwritten obligation to practice to high efficiency, to be able to hit the mark and ensure a quick and humane kill. Accepting this responsibility also means exhausting every means available in recovering a wounded animal. For York, an extensive group searched the next morning revealed both disappointment and relief. The evidence showed that his animal had not sustained a life-threatening wound. Back in the same area for the last evening of the hunt, the bull was seen back to the business at hand, shadowing his harem of cows. To accept truth and responsibility and impose an ethical standard on one's actions are the cornerstone traits of the true hunter-conservationist. It is a core value born out of a lifelong respect for all wildlife, but especially the hunted. Closed captioning provided by the Dallas Safari Club, promoting conservation and ethical hunting worldwide.